In the days of Adam, God gave a prophecy to him and to his son, Seth, and said that one day he would destroy the world by flood, but he didn't stop there. He also said one day he would destroy the world a second time by fire. Gary Stearman is here to discuss this ancient prophecy. And J.R., it's a, it's a prophecy really that may be said to be the beginning of all prophecies. Speaking of the sons of Seth before the flood, Josephus writes, <clears throat> they also inhabited the same country without dissensions, a happy condition, without any misfortunes falling upon them till they died. Uh, they also were the inventors of that peculiar sort of wisdom which is concerned with the heavenly bodies and their order. So they were astronomers. And that their inventions might not be lost before they were sufficiently known upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed at one time by the force of fire and at another time by the violence and quantity of water they made two pillars, the one of brick, the other of stone. They inscribed their discoveries on them both, that in case the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood, the pillar of stone might remain and exhibit those discoveries to mankind and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick erected by them. Now, this remains in the land of Syriad to this day. And as Josephus wrote in the first century, J.R., the land of Syriad in the Greek, that's Egypt, there was a pillar of stone remaining, and it's called the Great Pyramid. Now, what's so fascinating to me is the very word pyramid refers to fire. It does. Uh, and in fact, we use the word uh, funeral pyre mm -hmm. uh, as, as a takeoff from that root word. And uh, so pyramid meaning fire in the midst fire in the midst. And many people have said that the pyramid contains a great number of secrets yet to be understood, among them energies of various kinds, fire if you will. You know, Josephus said there that that pyramid contains an inscription of the previous brick edifice yes. that was built. And I don't suppose that's ever been found. It hasn't been found yet, but it, uh, I think it will be when the time is right. Because the pyramid seems to be a, a, a message sent forward through time to those able to understand its deeper meanings. And it was sent from before the flood. By the way, JR, you and I have both noted the fact that uh, if you go to the Queen's Chamber in the pyramid, you'll discover salt crystals there to this very day, deposits from salt water. The fact that the pyramid was under the ocean for a while. So the flood has come and gone. Yes. But the fire is yet to come. There are um, times in the Bible when God uh, continues this prophecy, biblical prophecies of the coming fire. I want us to look first at um, the ancient destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I was down south of the Dead Sea in that area one day and picked up this rock, which I would like to show you. You can see how it burned it is and, and how the heat transfer was so quick that it cracked the rocks apart. Mm -hmm. And the clay then in later years came in and solidified. And if you'll notice underneath where the burn stops, and it's good rock beyond that. Uh, this particular rock from the region of Sodom and Gomorrah were caused by this. I picked this up in the same area that I got this rock. This is brimstone. It even has the sulfur smell of a burnt match head to this mm -hmm. very day. Gary. Yes. And so God certainly knows how to send a fire from heaven, doesn't he? He certainly does. And uh, J.R., <clears throat> this brings us to our subject. Uh, uh, a study we've done for our latest uh, magazine, Prophecy in the News, called The Bible and the Bomb in which we discuss judgment by fire. Now one fire uh, definitely comes from God. It is supernaturally ordained. The other seems to be generated by man, nuclear energy. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, in Genesis 23, uh, that is uh, 1923, we read this. Uh, the sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And to make a long story short, those two cities are completely 
gone now. They have been covered up. And if you could find them, they would be infused with, with this brimstone and, and salt deposits and all kinds of horrible uh, poisons uh, that, that killed out all life down there at the south end of the Dead Sea. Now, some say this brimstone came from a volcano, though I don't know of any volcanoes in the immediate area. Did it come from outer space? Is it possible? You know, Gary, the people over in Mecca have an asteroid mm -hmm. that fell from the sky, and that has become their holy rock. It has indeed. I wonder if maybe they visited uh, Earth about the same time. <laughs> well, J.R., we, we hear the scientists talking about asteroids coming close, Earth-grazing asteroids. Uh, and we don't know what mechanism God uses to bring divine fire. He could use that method. Uh, in the book of Revelation, there is much discussion about that. But uh, when it comes to divine fire, uh, there are several instances of that. For example, in the days of Moses, uh, when Moses stretched forth his rod in the seventh of ten horrific plagues. And we read about this in, in Exodus 9, 23 and following. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire ran along upon the ground. And the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. And so here's divine fire of some sort. Uh, I think scientifically unexplainable fire. Unless, of course, uh, it could be explained in the terms of an asteroid uh, falling and perhaps uh, such small uh, quantities or, or such minute uh, portions that it created hail as it came down through the clouds and created some kind of uh, fiery hail upon the earth. Nevertheless, it happened, and God said it would. That's the important thing. God knows how to destroy whatever He wants to destroy. Gary, just last week, an asteroid came very close to planet Earth. That's right. These earth-grazing asteroids that uh, science is now beginning to warn us about. Uh, there's no way to detect them before they get here, by the way. We, we sort of see them as they go past, which is uh, a little disconcerting. Uh, you know, the Lord also sent fire at the giving of the law at Mount Horeb. And as a matter of fact, we've uh, seen re recent videos showing the top of that mountain is blackened. And the rocks there are blackened as by external fire. And you know, what we have at the giving of the law is fire. Uh, the Lord came down upon the mountain. Uh, Deuteronomy 4.12 says, The Lord spake unto you out of the midst of fire. You heard the voice of words. And so there was fire, divine fire on the mountaintop at the giving of the law. The implication there was uh, also of judgment. In other words, if you can't keep my law, there's always the fire. Mm -hmm. And of course, Elijah called fire down from heaven to... Uh, burned the sacrifice when he had his confrontation with the prophets of Baal. And uh, there, are, there are other uh, examples as well. But, you know, Gary, the one, the fire that's going to destroy the earth in the last days is far greater than just one little ball of fire to burn up some oxen or to burn up 50 men, and as it was in one case. Absolutely. This is going to be worldwide. There will be a worldwide fire and fulfilling, and, and I, it interests me that Josephus records the prophecy given by God to Adam. You stop and think about it. Adam walked with uh, the Lord in the cool of the day, had many conversations with the Lord, and he must have learned many, many things, one of which uh, is that that judgment was coming. <clears throat> and, you know, we call this fiery judgment that's yet ahead of us the day of the Lord. Prophet Joel speaks of the day of the Lord, J.R. Yes. In Joel chapter 2, we have this interesting um, description of how the fire is going to come in the last days. Listen to verse 5. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Now, Gary, nothing like that has ever happened before in history, at least in the days of the Bible. 
But in our day, with the invention of the uh, Stearman biplane <laughs> by your uncle, <laughs> oh my. and uh, all of the developments since then, airplanes can leap and sound like fire and sound like a flame of fire, um, can certainly deliver fire across the tops of mountains. Isn't it amazing how quickly we went from biplanes to planes that could hurl fire down from heaven, in yeah. vast quantities, by the way, in just a few decades. Yes. It's absolutely amazing. Well, we've a lot more to talk about, and we'll get to it when we come back in just a moment. But we want to talk about nuclear fire. That seems to be what the Lord is basically referring to. I suppose Joel is the most important prophecy concerning the fire of the last days. After telling us in chapter 2, verse 5, that the noise of the chariots would be on the tops of the mountains, shall they leap, he says, sounds to me like modern airplanes. These kind of chariots fly over the tops of the mountains and deliver fire, and a fire devours before them. In fact, everything behind them is a wilderness. Everything in front of them looks like the Garden of Eden, he said. But now listen to verse 30 in the last part of Joel chapter 2. This is the famous prophecy. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Gary, only bombs cause pillars of smoke. That is quite true. And particularly, the nuclear bomb causes a, a tall column with a mushroom cloud at the top. All these seem to be images uh, of the time when the nations are gathered to defeat Jerusalem and Israel. And Isaiah 29, 6 and 7 speak of this same thing. Thou shalt be visited of the Lord of hosts with thunder, with earthquake, a great noise, with storm and tempest, the flame of devouring fire, and the multitude of all nations that fight against Ariel, even all that fight against her and her munition, and that distress her, shall be a dream as a dream of a night vision. In other words, says Isaiah, a nightmare. This is going to be a nightmare image of devouring fire. By the way, J.R. Ariel is the name of Jerusalem as a rampant lion. Now, another interesting thing here, Gary, is that he talks about a devouring fire, and then he talks about the nations fighting, and he talks about her munitions. So evidently, the fire is a part of the munitions. This is yes. modern technology, yes. because they didn't fight with fire as such in the days of Joel. Absolutely not. Uh, also a side note here, of course, Ariel just happens to be the name of the first name of the Prime Minister of Israel today. Wow. What about Isaiah chapter 33? What does he say just a few chapters later? Well, Isaiah 33 <clears throat> is, is talking about uh, the same general time period the earth mourneth and languisheth. Lebanon is ashamed and hewn down. Sharon is like a wilderness. Bashan and Carmel shake off their fruits. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now will I be exalted. I will lift up myself. Uh, ye shall conceive chaff. Ye shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you, and the people shall be as the burnings of lime. As thorns cut up shall they be burned in the fire. J.R., this is a time when the enemy invades. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I mean, this sounds like modern warfare to me. This does not sound like divine fire being rained down from some celestial place or other. This sounds like the hand of man. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it's interesting as we go back to that prophecy we talked about wherein uh, the Lord told Adam there would be that destruction of the earth by fire. He was talking about the fire that man would be able to make to destroy himself in the latter days. Fascinating. Now in this 33rd chapter, of course, uh, he just happens to mention Lebanon and Bashan and Carmel and a place called Sharon. Yes. Well, you know, Sharon just happens to be the last name of the Prime Minister <laughs> of Israel. So in chapter 29, uh, the prophecy of fire, uh, he talks about Ariel and uh, here Sharon. I'm not saying that means anything in particular, but it is kind of interesting that in these two passages, Isaiah just happens to sort of put it together, you know? Indeed. Well, in the next few minutes, we have two more examples of this latter-day fire. Uh, Zechariah, in chapter 12 of his prophecy, uh, verses 3 and 4, a uh, very famous prophecy, in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. 
Uh, this talks about the coming of the enemy against Jerusalem. In verse 4 he says, In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, and his rider with madness. And I will open uh, mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And J.R., what's interesting as you continue through this prophecy is this, and the governors of Judah say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem uh, shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand, on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem." Wow. Isn't that an amazing... Yes, you know those opening verses, uh, cha uh, chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, uh, it says here that the, all the people of the earth gathered together against it. Uh, Gary, this is a war. It is. This is an army fielded against Jerusalem. And uh, that's what makes it so interesting here, because they're going to be smitten with blindness, every horse and every person, blindness. Could that be the blindness caused by the flash of nuclear uh, light, of an explosion of some kind? I believe so, and we have further evidence of that later on. You know, these governors of, uh, of Judah, the Hebrew word for governor there is aluf or alufim, and this refers to a secular governor running Israel, a, a jointly running Israel. And, mm -hmm. and you know, when Zechariah wrote this prophecy, there was no such political setup. There is today. Uh, we have the Knesset, and we have Israel governed by the Knesset and, and by these Aliufim, which gives us the, an idea this is indeed a latter-day prophecy. So in the days of the Bible, uh, especially in the days of the kingdom, uh, Israel was ruled by a king, not yes. Aliufim. Right, exactly. Fascinating. As Zechariah continues, he says, And this shall be the plague. He describes what happens to people, wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. I could read more, but that is a graphic image. And the fire coming from the governors of Judah, it has to be a nuclear fire. And J.R., to be consumed while you're still standing on your feet that quickly, that sounds nuclear to me. Um, some kind of a tremendous uh, radiation blast? Perhaps so. Travels at the speed of light before the impact of the concussion yeah. hits you? And knocks you down. Yeah. Hmm. What you have here, perhaps, the neutron bomb, which uh, uh, exhibits characteristics exactly as described by Zechariah. Well, we're down now to the last uh, short while on our program, and I did want to mention the Battle of Gog in Ezekiel 38. And J.R., uh, we have here uh, fire mentioned again and again and again. Uh, and we have in Ezekiel 39, uh, verse 6, And I will send a fire upon Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. The word for isles there is eyim, and it, and it is the Hebrew word for continents. And I have this on very good authority from several Hebrew scholars. So what we're talking about is an intercontinental war. Can we use the word intercontinental ballistic missile here? Wow. You know, just a few weeks ago, India and Pakistan faced off against each other with the threat of nuclear war. Our State Department was able to talk them down and to get them to back off. Uh, showing them how tragic and how terrible such a thing would be. But that does not mean they won't start it up again mm. uh, at any time. But whether or not the nuclear war comes out of India and Pakistan, we know that there is a, uh, a, a number of nations that contain these weapons of mass destruction and they really are not well schooled on what will happen to them. And uh, so it is important that we do what is right to do here in the United States and try to keep the world from such a conflagration. However, one of these days, one of these days, we know 
it will come. God said it would. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> 